well, looking like a corpse. Um, which is very fitting for spooky Halloween advent calendar, get ready with me, horror movie chat. <laughs> Hi. So today, guess what we're going to talk about? Uh, we're not going to talk about P. Adam Sidney. That's for darn sure. Um, visionary film, the American avant-garde, fucking visionary filmmakers, and the heritage of Emerson. I don't want any part in any heritage unless it includes the heritage that is fucking Kirk Harvey and Damon Packard, baby. Fame. So yeah, today we're talking about Carnival of Souls um, and Dawn of an Evil Millennium. Oh man, spraying on some jazz club because we're feeling very masculine, very American here, over here. Oh, you know this perfume like blooms really hard like an hour after you put it on so you can't smell it right now but you'll smell it in like an hour um i'm feeling pretty dry today and every day so instead of using a normal primer i'm just gonna use an old milk makeup like 
tea tree stick or something as primer and like hope that it calms my terrible red skin. Um, truly, I have the complexion of like a drunk in a Norman Rockwell painting. So I really just kind of need all the help I can get over here, so. So today we are talking about Herc Harvey's Carnival of Souls, 1962, and uh, Damon Packard's Dawn of an Evil Millennium, 1988. Um, two very exciting movies from masters of the American avant-garde. Oh. Oh. Maybe Carnival of Souls wouldn't be the most intuitive pick for, um, <laughs> for a show about unsung heroes of American cinema. You know, it's got a Criterion release. It's sort of like, I don't, it's got a certain amount of like critical praise or like, you know, mainstream attention or whatever. Um, but the thing about Carnival of Souls, um, and FYI, I'm talking about the 1962 original, not the weird 1990, 2000? What year was? I don't know. I've never seen the remake. I don't know. But yeah, not talking about the original 1962 Carnival of Souls and not the remake. But when people talk about Carnival of Souls, even as, you know, considering it as like an influ a very influential movie or as like an art film or whatever, there's still this sort of like backhanded quality about it. Even the uh, Lawrence Kansas documentary, like Lawrence, Lawrence Kansas like news agency documentary about Carnival of Souls in that looks, I think it was filmed in like the mid 90s or something like that. Like even that has like an extensive shot of this like dumb college student talking about if it's like not his favorite movie. YouTube is full of reviewers sort of like pointing out what they see as plot holes with the movie, which is like, it's not a plot hole. You just didn't understand the fucking movie. Like, oh, <laughs> link down below. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but seriously though, you know, I'm not here to bury Carnival of Souls. I'm here to praise <laughs> Carnival of Souls. That's a reach. I'm not here to bury Carnival of Souls, okay? I'm here to praise Carnival of Souls. Um, because it's just an amazing movie. It's one of one of my favorites. I think it's one of the first movies that really sort of like got me into, you know, trash cinema and by extension avant-garde cinema because they're kind of like, you know, as far as my intellectual career, like inner life, they're kind of one in the same. So this was a big, big movie for me as a kid. Movies with Chihuahua Wine Mom. It's <laughs> Now that I'm moisturized after a fashion, um, let me go in with my favorite Glossier watery ass foundation. And I even have a beauty blender this time around so I won't just be mashing it into my face like I'm a kindergartner. Um, although that's fine too if you do that, which I do that more often than not. If I'm being real, when I don't have the eye of the YouTube panopticon on me, I'm kind of a mashing makeup into my face with my hands kind of girl, but that's fine. Um, this is a spoiler-free review, by the way, just FYI, because it does have a twist. In the documentary that I mentioned, it it reveals the fucking like twist of the movie, like in the documentary. I'm like, yo, like a lot of people haven't seen this movie. Like you're like wrecking it for people. Like what are you doing, Lawrence, Kansas? It was produced. It was like written, produced, and directed, and like starred like this one like. Lawrence, Kansas news guy who's clearly just like a carnival of souls nut. That's actually really cute. So it's about this woman who survives this terrible car accident. Lone woman who feels totally isolated from her surroundings and all of the people around her and she goes to a f like a different town to become a church organist, even though she admittedly has no religious feeling at all whatsoever and it's just a job for her. Like she kind of reminds me of um, like people who have had lobotomies, 
like lobotomy patients back in the day, they would post lobotomy be totally malleable and have no will of their own and also be totally devoid of any kind of religious impulse, which I think is really interesting and scary. Um, like she almost seems like somebody who has had a lobotomy. Um, like in terms of her affect. Um, so she's menaced by the specter of this ghostly man who she sees everywhere and she also goes into these episodes where she is completely cut off from the world around her to the point of being invisible to other denizens of the world. Like she's literally just like a like a specter sort of like wandering through the world and nobody can see her and she can't interact with anybody. And she is um, also like inexorably drawn to this um, very creepy old pavilion, a real pavilion that was the model for this sort of like creepy fantasy pavilion. It had at one point been on the shores of Salt Lake but since it was originally built, the lake receded. So it was kind of just this sort of like creepy abandoned pleasure palace, like almost just kind of like, you know, a half a mile from the lake or something like that. Like, just very weird. Um, I'm going in with a Glossier stretch concealer as usual. And my lips are really dry today, so I'm gonna exfoliate with e.l.f. Mmm. I'm drool all over myself. Yum! So tasty! So I saw a really interesting interview with Herc Harvey, um, the director, and John Clifford, the writer of Carnival of Souls, where they talked about how people sort of like project all of this meaning and subtext and subtlety onto the movie um, in this way that is n not really in keeping with what they were trying to do. Like, I think the exact way that Herc Harvey phrased it was like, uh, he's such a cute old man. It was literally like, I was trying to make a horror movie with Zazz. Like, <laughs> like just so adorable. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, they... It seems like they appreciate the meaning that people project onto the movie, but at the same time, it's not really something they were going for. And honestly, you could just look at this as a horror movie with Zazz. You could just look at this as, you know, like a sort of fucking more sophisticated version of like the brain that wouldn't die or something. And like, I wouldn't fault you for it. And you know, it's just, it's just enjoyable as a movie. But at the same time, Carnival of Souls is one of those movies that will like it seems to hold as much meaning as the viewer is able to imbue, um, which I think is why it's one of those movies that like boring people think it's boring. <laughs> like the movie is only going to give you as much as you are willing to put into it. The story of Herc Harvey and John Clifford is really interesting because they worked together making industrial films at a company in Lawrence, Kansas called uh, Centron. When I see these films, I think of MSG3K, you know, these shorts about, you know, juvenile delinquency or like what to do at the party or like welcome to Kansas, like that style of stuff, um, which is, yeah, pretty interesting that they just like went into making this movie. Um, this movie is also the victim of bad luck and specifically bad distribution, which um, I work in distribution in a different industry. So it's always like <laughs> distribution stories are always really interesting to me. Oh no. Oh no, what did I do with my primer process? Okay, here we go. Uh, priming with Elf. Elf is just in the mix today, I guess. Um, I'm a cheap little elf. It's easy to make fun of the kind of films that Centron made now because they are super hokey and like silly and very sort of like guileful and like goofy in a very an extremely like you know 1950s way but at the same time it's like they're films with a definite purpose 
meant to impart a message or, you know, convey some kind of information. They're films with a definite goal. One of my fil favorite filmmakers, Alexander McKendrick, who used to do like a bunch of those old really snappy like Ealing comedies back in the 50s and 60s. Um, like he did uh, Man in the White Suit. Um, later in life moved to California and he taught filmmaking to young people. And um, there is a really wonderful book of his that's just sort of like his teaching notes, just kind of compiled and edited basically. It's like his ethos. Your audience has a million better things to do. Like your audience has a lot of things that they could be doing instead of watching your movie. Like, don't waste their time. <laughs> and I think that, you know, the makers of Centron films kind of had like the same ethos where like they have a pretty tight budget and they have a specific sort of message that they need to convey and like specific information, you know, a specific set of facts probably that they needed to impart. And it's like, I feel like Herc Harvey and John Clifford took this mindset to their first like narrative fictional feature film in a way that's really kind of refreshing. I mean, definitely to the modern eye Carnival of Souls like plods in parts. I mean, maybe, I don't know, a person could say that, but it never feels, Carnival of Souls never feels self-indulgent, um, which is honestly kind of saying a lot. <laughs> so I just impulse bought this Milani palette. I think it's called like something stupid. Oh, Jewel Heist. I love crime. It's true. Carnival of Souls had uh, distribution trouble. They were initially distributed by a company called Hertz Lion, um, who essentially kind of like, it sounds like just took the money and ran. Um, which is crazy how often that would happen back in the day. Like distribution was clearly a very shady business before I got into it is all I can say. And I've never used this palette before, so we'll see how this works. Oh, that's kind of nice. Okay. And then I guess a reel of the film was lost when they were exposing it. Like they just completely overexposed the reel and it was not usable or salvageable in any way. There is one trained actor in the movie and that is Candace Hillegoss who plays the main character, Mary. And other than that, everybody is literally like I don't mean this in a derogatory way at all whatsoever, but like everybody's just some like random schmuck from Kansas and it's very, it feels very like Verismo <laughs> to put it in a really pretentious way. Like it feels kind of like, it feels kind of like how in Pasolini's movies he would cast just like random non-actor like Italians. It feels a lot like that. Like a, like, Kansas version of that. It's actually, like, it works a lot better than you would kind of think it would. Um, this is the only real movie that Candace Hillegas was in. She was in some other just kind of, like, random crap, but her Wikipedia page literally just has, like, three films and two TV shows listed in it. Um, I guess she, it sounds like she gave up her career to marry some actor that I had never heard of. And the only credit of his I really recognized was Star Trek Next Gen. Um, but her memoir, her self-published memoir about her marriage to this man is called the Odyssey and the Idiocy, um, which sounds amazing. Um, she has a surprisingly strong social media presence, which is pretty cool. Um, like her like YouTube and Facebook are actually pretty well maintained. And she even has a pretty slick website where you can 
buy um, autographed 8x10 glossies of her for like 20 bucks. So guess what I'll be doing tonight. And she still looks great. She's um, she's 85 now. She looks absolutely gorgeous. So we stan. We stan Candace. So if the writer and director of this movie have given us kind of like carte blanche to project as much onto it as we want. Um, so what are we projecting onto this movie? You could interpret it as, you know, a metaphor for autism, um, sort of like alienation from the family, alienation from religion, alienation from society in general. Like, it feels like such a profound movie um, when she sort of like monologues about being, you know, apart from the world. It feels a little funny to use a sort of like religious reference here, considering that Mary does not have any religious feeling in her at all whatsoever to the point where it's like sort of weird, but she's definitely like in the world, but not of it. Like all of the sequences, you know, where she's just sort of like totally cut off from everyone. Like, it's just like so, is so powerful. Um, but at the same time, it's like engaging enough to just be viewed as like a fun, goofy, low budget horror movie. The male character that menaces her is just sort of referred to as the man. It's almost, it's funny that we're doing this the week after De La Morte De La More because it's like, she, he's the sort of like, non-sexual, aggressive, terrifying, sort of like counterpoint to she um, from De La Morte De La More, so. But the like pleasure pavilion that she's drawn to and is the scene of the sort of like climax of the movie um, is like really creepy. In the documentary that I watched, the interview with her Harvey, he talked about how they like they managed to dig up the electrician that used to work at the Pleasure Pavilion when it was still in business and just literally had him like hook everything up and the lights still worked. And all of the decorations you see in the movie are just like legit abandoned decorations from the original pavilion, which is like also terrifying. Like that's so creepy. Like the movie is so, normally the, mystique of a movie is ruined by watching the, you know, writer, director, actor, whoever talk about it. But in this case, it's like, oh, there's a whole creepy like element to this movie that I never quite even realized because it's like, you know, those are real creepy decorations in the Pleasure Pavilion. No bug. Um, yeah, and the sort of like ghouls that menace her, the man and his sort of like fellow, fellow ghosts, I guess, um, all have sort of like 1920s makeup on. And it's very like, I feel like there is nothing creepier than the fleeting ephemeral pleasures of the past. You know, like there is nothing creepier to think about than now dead people formerly having like frothy fun. Like there's nothing creepier than like ghosts at a carnival. Like, let's be real. There's a reason why like carnivals are creepy, circuses are creepy, Christmas is fucking creepy. It's because it's like in the, in the context of our own mortality, like fleeting pleasures are like fucking creepy. The scariest object I own, I go around to, like just semi-abandoned stores where the person working the desk is like 95% a corpse. <laughs> like just buying the most haunted looking shit I can possibly find. Like my personal aesthetic is extreme like seance grandma. And like, I can tell you the fucking, I'm pretty sure the most haunted object I own is a record of, um, like South American pop music from the 1930s. Literally people are speaking to you in the creepy voices of the dead. It is like frightening. Um, yeah. <laughs> so out of all the just like macabre 
horrible shit I own. Um, I did fairly recently pick up a newspaper clipping of a woman uh, committing suicide and she's in mid air, like falling to the ground. I brought it home and like put it in my living room and looked at it and I'm like, oh, I like kind of have a problem. <laughs> maybe, like maybe this just got too real. This was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. But even that is not as creepy as my creepy fucking like Brazilian 1930s pop music record. I'm going in with Conspiracy, um, Shade Flaming Hot. Um, and there are all sorts of like accidentally profound moments in this movie. Like there's one point where um, Mary is playing the organ. She's practicing the organ in uh, the church that employs her and the camera is sort of like panning over the various like aspects of the church and it rests on this um, stained glass window that says uh, cast out demons on it. Like it has a picture of this sort of like sinister looking um, saint and this, yeah, this text beneath it that says cast out demons. And like, it feels, there's this funny sort of duality about it because it feels so scary and so profound and like it's so easy in the moment to believe that the filmmaker was you know making some kind of like really strong statement about something or there's like this deep-seated meaning behind including that image but at the same time it's like I feel like with that shot of the movie her car view was like shooting the rodeo you know like it was just there and sort of like creepy looking and he decided to shoot it um i tried to google if it if that stained glass image is still around or not i couldn't find it so if you live in kansas and you have the scoop let me know okay okay damn that looks patriotic yeah what do you think very patriotic. <laughs> Very patriotic. It's like Mary has these um, spells of sort of like invisibility or like disconnectedness or what have you. Like these almost sort of like dissociative episodes. But at the same time, it's like how different is that from her real life, you know? She has no connections, no friends. She doesn't really feel any sort of like strong emotions about her job, like no ties to any aspect of her life, apparently. Um, in the sort of like, you know, litany of kind of like predictable complaints people have about this movie, they complain about the main character, Mary, not being sufficiently fleshed out or she's not believable or relatable or you know whatever but i think that's actually one of the major strengths of the movie it's like this is a little bit of a reach maybe but in the book understanding comics scott mcleod talks briefly about how it is easier for people to project themselves onto characters in comics if they're sort of like sketchily drawn if that makes any sense um like you know it's really easy to project yourself onto charlie brown because charlie brown is like five lines i also think that this movie is particularly relevant in not just the era of coronavirus or what have you but just the sort of like general cu cultural malaise that was present before any of this shit went down. Like, it's like, you know, people, I mean, loneliness is supposed to be like an epidemic, right? Like, everybody feels disconnected from the world around them, from their work, from other people. Um, like, 
this total sort of like alienation from every single facet of life. Um, like it's very sad. Like I see, you know, not to get too personal about it, but yeah, I see a lot of myself in Mary and I'm sure a lot of like, you know, people watching this movie in circa 2020, like have the same feeling like her extreme alienation and confusion and sort of like non-emotion is very very relatable like it feels she has very modern problems um which is probably you know one of the reasons why this movie has survived as long as it has um i mentioned earlier that it got a criterion release i don't like a lot of the critical chatter around this movie because I feel like most people kind of just like don't get it but um the essay for that was included in the dvd of carnival of souls um by this woman Kira La Janice who is this like cool chick who writes a lot of very highbrow you know kind of prose about very lowbrow movies which is something I can really appreciate um she does actually have a really informative and like cool essay on this so also I feel like Criterion might Okay, don't tell Criterion I said this, but I sometimes feel like they kind of pad their roster with films that are in the public domain. I subscribe to their streaming service and um, I appreciate, I love, I love public do domain movies. I love like goofy old shit that nobody wants anymore. It's my entire vibe basically. Um, so I'm not complaining about it, but yeah. So they might have, I don't know if they were trying to like, you know, if they had some sort of quota they needed to meet, some sort of like DVD release quota, um, and that's why they put this out on DVD, or if it really just, you know, war they felt like it warranted a release, or maybe it was a combination of both, I don't know. You know, I have a lot, lot of white... I have a lot of white powder. That sounds really weird. Um, no, I have a lot of white makeup, I guess I should say, um, but I'm really tempted by this very kind of pretty I don't know if it'll show up, but this pretty white Milani shade here, so I'm gonna try it out. Mary is an organist. Again, I, I'm sure this wasn't on purpose, um, but I feel like music is maybe the most abstract art besides perfume. It's really fitting, I guess I should say, that she's an organist because it is, you know, a non -rep a completely non-representational art um, with no real sort of like reference outside of itself for the most part. Um, so I think that's like really, I really like that she's an organist. Okay, there's a teensy bit of red in there. It's fine. Everything's fine. Calm down. Oh yeah, that's pretty. Way to go, Milani. Yeah. Truly worth my my eight dollars over here you know if i'm trying to say something about carnival of souls that like really has never been said before a i think candace hilgoss is the ultimate scream queen it is the most convincing terror acting i have ever seen she's amazing um because she goes from just like sort of uh impervious mannequin to just like manic like screeching lady and she even does that like real old school thing where she like grabs her face really hard when she screams i don't know it's really engaging yeah she trained under like lee strasberg or something um and she also went to the barbizon school because she was a model i think that Mario Bava references this movie in Lisa and the Devil. I can't find any evidence of this in any like interview with or documentation of Mario Bava, but I posit that the scene in Lisa and the Devil when it like the camera just flips up into the sky and suddenly she's like on the plane I think that's a reference to Carnival of Souls. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong, okay? It's like, <laughs> dude, what if this is like what I'm known for is making, it's like, okay, so it's like George Orwell 
before he was George Orwell, like literally, I mean, he wrote under a pseudonym, like I mean this literally, like before he was pseudonym George Orwell, he wrote an essay about Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels about like the, um, the race of like sentient talking like horse people. I think it's called like who, who in hymns or something? Um, it's been a long time since like sophomore English class, I'm sorry. Reading a lot of meaning into the fact that like Jonathan Swift made horses the most civilized nation that Gulliver visits and horses shit also doesn't smell bad. It sounds like I'm making this up, but I'm not. It's like a real thing. Um, but anyway, so, you know, if I'm known, maybe this will be my like, sliding doors like George Orwell moment where it's like this is what I'm known for. My claim to footnote fame is gonna be I made the connection between <laughs> Lisa and the Devil and Carnival of Souls and that weird ass like jump cut where it's like Lisa you know looks at the sky and suddenly she's like in her fucking um like boarding house room or whatever. It's gonna be my George Orwell who into him sliding doors moment baby in a future world where evil hunchback sorcerers roam the forests sure you are too so let's <laughs> appreciate it oh well damon packard dawn of an evil millennium dude this fucking movie the deeper i dive on damon packard this guy is just like a trip <laughs> like Dang. Dawn of an Evil Millennium, 1988. It's like a half hour long. It's technically a trailer um, for an 18 hour epic about um, like a demon that visits Earth and splits into two. And then it's got this sort of like buddy cop element, a little bit of like Kung Fu moment happening sorceress hunchback sorcerers dudes fighting on a jungle planet this movie crams a lot of movie into a half hour sequence that is technically supposed to be a trailer um it is super low budget shot on like a super eight camera i think it was originally a student project um it's got a lot of really wonderful shots of downtown la in the late 80s i don't know like early 20 something like dudes in it that they all kind of look like Ray Capo and it's super funny. Like it's a very like late 80s California kind of vibe, which is pretty cool. Um, I guess Stephen Packard took the sound effects from this movie for like, from like VHS copies of other movies. Um, so the sound effects on this movie are actually like really amazing. There's a lot of sort of like splorchy splat like disgusting you know sounds going on throughout the movie and it's really just like engaging and disgusting and super fun um miles o'keefe also makes an appearance he was in a bunch of like 
sword and sor really like cheapy like sword and sorcery type movies in the late 80s early 90s so it's this kind of like charming pastiche of like horror action which I don't I don't even really feel like that's like a thing anymore um but it's got yeah a lot of sort of like really cool like fighting gore sequences um including one that's like a parody of They Live, which was really ballsy to do that because at the time he made this, I think They Live had been out for like a year. <laughs> like, like that's so tight. Very, very Al Quran. And to top it all off, I'm going in with uh, Jeffree Star, Drug Lord. And this just like looks insane when it's on, so get ready. Oh, yeah. Give me that pigment, baby. I'm not a huge fan, honestly, of the Velour Liquid Lip, like, texture, but I mean, these colors are just so bizarre. Like, it's hard not to be really into it. So Dawn of an Evil Millennium ultimately is a lot like if if Hollis Frampton was the cinematographer for Lloyd Kaufman is how it feels. Like it's very like if Hollis Frampton did a trauma movie, <laughs> it would be Dawn of an Evil Millennium. Um, yeah, uh, Damon Packard is like a super interesting person. He now resides in a small, cheap, rented room in Eagle Rock, California, destitute, debased, and devoid of future projects. Amazing! Iconic! That is like some fucking EAP shit. EAP is a girl and Poe. Um, you know, like that's just like, dude, to throw your entire soul and all of your money into your creative endeavors and to get absolutely nowhere and die in poverty, that's like the American dream, <laughs> like straight up. What, you wanna be a successful artist? You wanna be a fucking like an Andy Warhol, a Jeff Koontz, a fucking, um, I don't know, what is that guy's name? The terrible balloon animal yeah, guy? Yeah, Jeff Koontz. Is it Jeff Koontz? Mm -hmm. Who am, oh, I'm thinking of Dean Koontz. They're brothers. No, you don't want to be any of these people. You want to be Damon fucking Packard. You don't want to be some commie sack of shit like Andy Warhol. You want to be a fucking American. Like there is nothing more American than just like failure than Damon Packard. Um, Damon Packard, if you're watching this, I don't think you're a failure. I think you're super fun and cool. Um, and he's still putting out movies just like on YouTube, just like these super fun little like, you know, movies about having to wear a mask or his, his like weird very cheesy kind of like stock footage adventures with his dog and stuff like that like it's just like I don't know it's so heartening that he's still putting out content in the face of like a world that's ignoring him like this like I feel like this sounds like a totally like backhanded compliment but it's not like I like really really respect and appreciate like Damon Packard's total sort of like career and energy. It's so much better to do your own thing than to seek the sort of like approbation of your peers because like fuck your peers. Your peers are stupid. Your peers don't know anything and your peers are doomed to die. <laughs> like don't seek the fucking attention of your peers. Like no. It's just you know the movie is just sort of this like wonderful action horror pastiche which is a genre you don't really see anymore and it's you know very kind of like throwbacky and super fun. In Damon Packard's movies, there is frequently a character with a, um, like a limping gait. Damon Packard also plays the demon in this movie, the main character, I guess you would say. Um, and he, the way that he moves his body, I recently finished John Keel's The Mothman Prophecies, and I, I don't imagine it was meant to be evocative of this in any way, but it does actually remind me of uh, John Keel, his like 
writing about the men in black and the way in which they move their bodies like they have never experienced like they have never had the experience of having a body before um so that's like really actually kind of creepy and william castle dwight fry and jack pierce are all buried in the same cemetery in uh glendale um and i think they like filmed in it like there's definitely a scene in the movie where he's like running across these in-ground gravestones but you can see like mountains in the background and like that's so the cemetery that I'm thinking of it was like because I went there on a pilgrimage to talk to William Castle got him insane there are warnings in the far reaches of the cemetery about like mountain lions and shit it's like a weirdly it's a cemetery with like weirdly like remote parts so I feel like this yeah the scene where he's like running across the graves and there are mountains in the background like I think it was filmed at this one specific cemetery in Glendale all these fun little sort of like pastiche musical cues where it's like you'll have one part where it sounds like almost kind of like Schoenberg-y, like very sort of like mid 20th century atonal like flute shit. And then it's another, you know, there's another part where it's got this like smoky jazz saxophone where you meet like the, you know, main half of the buddy cop duo. The musical cues are super on point, super fun. Like this is a genuinely like funny movie. Like I'm not, like true confession time i'm not a person with a great sense of humor i guess like i don't really see a lot of movies that i think are particularly like funny like i don't really like lol a lot if that makes any sense um but this movie like definitely makes me laugh out loud like every time i watch it like it's genuinely like a very funny movie so Damon Packard is still making um, short films and releasing them on YouTube. He's done some other like feature length stuff since Dawn of an Evil Millennium. Did his magnum opus in, I want to say 2002. I don't think it was like a really significant sum of money, but he got some money from a relative who passed away and he put it into his magnum opus, which he then pressed to DVR and like sent to a bunch of celebrities or something like it's this really like weird <laughs> convoluted story like um but the feature film of his that i am most interested in fatal pulse dude how can you resist a movie called fatal pulse that sounds like some straight up lifetime shit which like as you know i'm like obsessed with <laughs> like so good um yeah, but oh, so his career now, he has a company where he presses movies to DVR and sells them. And like, not just his movies, but like movies that it sounds like he taped off of TV, like as a child. Like if you go to his website, um, which I'll link to, cause it is really cool. Um, it's like a bunch of like made for TV horror movies and like Mondo shit and like Jalo trailers and like sword and sandal movie, like just very odd. Like the weird sort of like detritus of like, I don't know, like underground cinema. I, I don't know, like I'm just, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated and appalled <laughs> by the existence of Damon Packard. There's this part where um, you see the camera reflected in Miles O'Keefe's glasses. And I don't know if this is deliberate, but I feel like, <laughs> I feel like that's a reference to um, Sunset Boulevard, right? Where you see the uh, entire like camera set up reflected in Gloria Swanson's sunglasses for like a fraction of a second and you don't even notice because like Sunset Boulevard is so amazing. It's like, I feel like it's a reference to that. Going in with the eyeliner, I'm gonna use it as lip liner because what are we? We're an iconoclast.
Oh yeah, that looks weird as fuck. My first experience with Damon Packard, back in the day, I feel like I'm kind of dating myself by saying this, but um, like back in the day of mail order Netflix, when Netflix was a company where you would like pick DVDs and they would physically like send copies to you in the mail. Um, they had this like really amazing collection of avant-garde cinema, like <laughs> which sounds really weird. Um, but yeah, they had basically like every DVD you could ever possibly want. And um, they uh, happen to have a um, collection of experimental short films released in the early aughts um, called Experiments in Terror. I guess like you can still buy a physical copy of Experiments in Terror and I would really recommend it because it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, they had um, they had Dawn of an Evil Millennium on it and like I'm so glad they did because like there's no other way I would have known about this movie. You know? Unsung Heroes of American Cinema. Oh, Herc Harvey, we salute you. Damon Packard, we thank you for your service. You all make me proud to be an American. <laughs>